for today, I'm actually uh, uh, Mark Wong, um, <clears throat> which is a transformation that you don't often see. So uh, Mark is uh, unfortunately not able to be with us uh, today, but uh, hopefully he's going to walk in sometime during the presentation just to uh, tell me the bits I got wrong. So, so I'm standing in for Mark. Um, the, uh, so this talk is, uh, is written by Mark. Uh, and I'm going to attempt to give it uh, in uh, some justice to the way that he wrote it. Uh, Mark has performed uh, almost all of the work uh, that's described in this presentation uh, in the sense that uh, Mark is a, a really excellent uh, uh, um, uh, performance tester. Uh, now, Mark and I uh, started working together on Postgres performance about... Uh, eight or nine years ago, uh, we did a lot of early work on uh, Postgres performance in the sort of 8.0, 8.1, 8.2 type uh, timeframes. So Mark's ability to set up quite complex tests was, uh, was very important in uh, the an early analysis of uh, things like the hot feature, uh, where we, uh, it took quite a while to understand the behavior of the systems. Uh, so the type of work that uh, Jan and Robert uh, were showing in the last talk uh, is, uh, is very important. It can often take months or even years of work to truly understand what's happening. Um, so uh, I was lucky enough to be able to hire Mark uh, into Second Quadrant uh, about, uh, about a year ago, uh, and Mark's begun... Uh, quite a lengthy task of investigating uh, some of the aspects of performance on Postgres. Uh, luckily, we're not duplicating uh, the work that uh, Robert and Jan are doing. Uh, they're more focused on OLTP performance. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here today uh, is uh, around business intelligence performance uh, and focused on a number of different benchmarks. Uh, so I've got... Um, uh, a range of different graphics to show you, but uh, uh, I'm going to uh, go through the, the full story of, uh, of what we're going to look at. So starting in the background, we're going to discuss the, the patches and new features under test. And where's that noise? Is that outside? Sorry. <clears throat> so the, uh, the background to uh, this work is that uh, we're running a project in... Uh, Europe called Axel, uh, and that stands for Advanced Analytics on Extremely Large European Databases. Why European databases? Well, they're paying, so obviously. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, <coughs> luckily for us, European databases look almost identical to US databases. It's just the addresses that are different, so... <coughs> um, uh, the salaries are higher in the US, but hopefully that's just because you guys uh, get paid in dollars uh, rather than euros. But uh, I think somebody's made that joke already. So, so uh, the, the Axel project has got uh, a number of different partners, uh, a couple of different universities, uh, and another uh, small and medium enterprise. Uh, and we're working on a, a number of different aspects uh, of uh, uh, analytical systems. Uh, one of the most important of those, which uh, we don't normally get to talk about, is actually security and privacy. Uh, and so uh, this project also sponsored work on row-level security uh, and also the work that's being done on audit. Um, so the, uh, <coughs> the things that I'm going to talk to you today are really about the, uh, the core extensions to Postgres uh, that we've been working on um, and uh, performance testing around that. So there is quite a lot of stuff coming out of this project uh, that, uh, that's worth talking about, but it's, it's difficult to mention it all. So <coughs> uh, what we uh, had uh, a look at to do some testing on uh, <coughs> was uh, uh, the 9.5 development edition of uh, Postgres uh, so that's not going to be available to you for production use until approximately September this year, uh, assuming uh, the commit fest closes sometime before then, uh, <coughs> which uh, uh, 
Uh, it is supposed to close on March the 15th. Oh. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, we decided to uh, evaluate a, n a number of different uh, features. Uh, one of those is something called a BRIN index, which I'm going to explain to you what it's for uh, and show you some results uh, about what it does do and what it doesn't do. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we've evaluated uh, a couple of other patches uh, related to performance uh, in, in a business intelligence context. Um, so, uh, there are also the benefits inherent in some of the other work that's been done. So, even though I'm not talking about it specifically, uh, there are some, some other tweaks that are, are giving us performance improvements as well, but uh, I'm not going not gonna to go into those. So, the first feature is uh, block range indexes, or BRIN indexes, uh, and they were written by uh, Alvaro Herrera, uh, they were originally known as min-max indexes and uh, like various other names before that. But if you're familiar with uh, Oracle Exadata, uh, there's something called a storage index in that system. Uh, and this is in some ways very similar um, to that. So what is the objective of a BRIN index? Well, it's basically uh, a, 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 an index type that's aimed at very large... Uh, databases. Uh, the idea is that um, we want to avoid some of the overheads that you get on B tree indexes. Now, uh, who's got a database larger than 100 gigabytes? Cool. <clears throat> so you'll know that uh, building B tree indexes on very large tables sucks. And uh, that becomes something of a problem because if you've got 100 gigabytes of data and three or 400 gigabytes of indexes, uh, then clearly the indexes uh, become the bottleneck. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, we realize that uh, performance with B tree indexes can be very nice. Uh, so what we're looking for is something that's a bit like a B tree, but solves some of the problems with B trees. And that's kind of what we get uh, with BRIN. Uh, what we have is a, an index type that exploits the natural order of the data on disk. Uh, and if you're going to say to me, yes, but not all columns have a natural order on disk, then you would be absolutely right. And in those cases, a BRIN index is not going to give you much at all. Okay? So the cases where a BRIN index is going to help you are things like a date column, because obviously as we write uh, data to uh, the database, there's a natural ordering associated with uh, the log date uh, on events. Now it just so happens that date is of course one of the most important uh, use cases because there are actually very large historical tables uh, is a very frequent use case in databases. Uh, the other uh, case is where there's some kind of natural ordering uh, around uh, the use of uh, primary keys that are assigned via sequences, for example, an order number. So we know that uh, if we're accessing an order number that is 100,000 orders into the past, we know that that's likely to be associated with a particular area of disk. So what we're doing with BRIN is we're actually exploiting the natural ordering of the data as a way of uh, speeding up queries. Okay? So uh, that gives us quite a few different advantages and I'll show that that has actually uh, realised itself in our implementation. So in a B tree, we keep track of all of the data. So in a B tree index, every single record in the main table has got an entry in the B tree. So there's a there's a one-to-one -one relationship between rows and index pointers. In a BRIN index, we only index ranges of values. So for example, if we pick a, a range bound in the BRIN index of 10 megabytes, then we will have two index pointers for that 10 megabyte range of the index. 
So as a result, you can see that the Brin index has significantly fewer index pointers within it. And as a result, the, the index is going to be a lot more compact. Now, with the right data, we can still get roughly similar performance between a Brin index and a B tree, but the index itself could be around a uh, thousand or ten thousand times smaller than a B tree index. Uh, so, some of the other patches that uh, we're testing uh, are the, the concurrent hash table uh, patch that uh, Robert had written. Uh, and there's also uh, a series of patches that uh, Andres had written uh, related to uh, atomic locking. Uh, so the, uh, the concurrent hash technique uh, was basically exploiting uh, this patch as well. Um, and in addition to this particular atomic patch, there's a lock less clock sweep uh, patch which related to uh, buffer eviction. So basically, making shared buffers more efficient. Uh, and that was quite important in business intelligence because we were actually dealing with quite large uh, expanses of data. Um, there's also some uh, changes to the way that uh, LW locks were padded, uh, which caused um, uh, problems with false sharing. Yeah, I'm just reading the slides, so... <laughs> he says, uh, <coughs> yes, poor excuse, crap. <laughs> yeah, so. um, yeah, that was a very poor excuse, wasn't it? <clears throat> we won't try that gambit again. So um, we, uh, we've done some tests on a, a couple of different systems. Uh, we've got uh, two different systems under test. Uh, the first one is at Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Um, and uh, the characteristics of this system is that it's got uh, a very large storage array, uh, quite well connected, uh, but it's, uh, so it's a, a storage intensive system. Uh, and then the second one um, has got uh, a much smaller um, uh, storage array, but it's got uh, faster, a bigger RAM and faster CPUs. Uh, so we were able to compare and contrast the, the two different types of hardware uh, for these tests. Obviously, there's a, there's a size limit on what we could do on the Manchester machine. So, so the tests uh, that we're looking at here um, were basically the uh, TPCH uh, benchmark. Uh, why TPCH? Well, I think the main thing is it's uh, a reasonably well-specified test. Uh, obviously, there's uh, discussion points around uh, whether it's an applicable test, uh, and we've tried not to kind of get too anal about the, uh, the, the, the specifics of the test. Uh, so what we've focused really on is the, the intention of the tests uh, themselves. Uh, we've also compared uh, the difference between power and throughput tests. Uh, the, the main difference between power and throughput is um, uh, the power test is, in some senses, uh, a measure of the ability of the system to dynamically um, show uh, performance results. So if you're uh, an analyst, uh, uh, or a data miner, and you're sitting in front of the system waiting for it to finish, how long does that take? Uh, whereas the throughput test uh, measures the ability of the system to produce uh, significant numbers of reports. So in that case, it's much more to do with uh, uh, the ability of the system to absorb uh, a concurrent workload. And actually, it turns out that the two different types of tests are actually, uh, we get different results in each. So the uh, TPCH load test uh, is actually uh, quite a complex schema in these days where having more than one table is considered heresy. <laughs> so 
<coughs> look, it's got almost 10. So, um, <coughs> and uh, it, it's not even in a star schema format. So uh, what I do know uh, is uh, that the test was originally developed by Teradata um, uh, in the days when uh, people wanted to express their business problems in application neutral data formats. Uh, and uh, so a lot of the queries involve significant uh, and complex joins uh, that we really wouldn't get on some of the simpler uh, Hadoop style uh, systems. So, uh, but you know, I think that's a, that's a pretty reasonable test. There's a variant of the TPCH uh, test called the Star Schema Benchmark, uh, but the reason why we haven't gone into that is simply that the, the tests themselves are, are, are slightly tweaked around and it kind of, it's a bit confusing to, to compare things accurately. So we've, so, so for these purposes, we've just stuck to the, uh, the TPCH test. Um, Mark has got, uh, you know, some pretty strict methodologies about uh, running the test uh, and uh, a, a, as you've seen there are some points of the presentation that I, uh, that I don't know in detail. Uh, what I would say is I was working uh, fairly regularly with Mark on, on the results of the test. So uh, although he performed the tests we were discussing the results, so I didn't necessarily work with him on the details of the methodology and uh, some of the things here he's uh, talking about um, the, the specifics of the, the actual load uh, and the power tests. Uh, the, the tests themselves uh, look uh, like this. There's 22 separate queries in the, uh, the test suite um, and they are typically complex queries. Uh, what's good about this uh, benchmark is that they're not made up tests. Uh, they actually represent useful business questions against that data set. Uh, and that is what I consider to be particularly important because very often when you see people talk about uh, business intelligence performance, they use a a made up unreal query that just happens to go really quickly on their tests. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we were looking to do was to make the tests as real world as possible. So we're not trying to blind you with some impressive results on a particular, you know, small set of queries. We're, we're interested in uh, uh, measuring how well we're doing. Uh, in terms of Postgres performance uh, across the board, okay? So uh, I, th there's no sort of sense of trying to get good results here. We're trying to get realistic uh, results, uh, representative results. Um, <clears throat> and query 12 uh, is another example of that. Uh, there's uh, probably about two thirds of the queries in the, uh, the query mix have got uh, restrictions on date ranges, uh, but this is uh, a, quite a nice example of uh, a complex query where we're joining uh, the orders table and the line item table, so we've got a kind of master detail relationship going on, um, and that uh, consists of uh, a complex case statement, uh, there's some complex where clauses, complex joins, and followed by an aggregation. So I think that's a fairly typical example of the, the queries in the test suite. Uh, so it does actually cover most of the things that we would like it to. So let's go through to the Brin tests. So what we're doing is uh, loading uh, the data initially with no indexes, uh, and then we're going to load data into a table that's got a single B tree index and then we're going to do the same thing, but with a Brin index. Um, and I'm going to flick ahead to the results, because I understand these. <coughs> so uh, the uh, column on the left is how long it takes to load a table with data, and in that case it took 5.1 minutes uh, to load uh, a 10 gigabyte uh, scale factor test. With the Brin index added uh, onto that table, 
uh, the, the load plus the index build took 5.6 minutes. And now with one B tree index, the load time leaps up to 9.4 minutes. So the effect of the B tree index is to almost double the load time. Whereas in the case of the Brin index, we're basically only adding 10% to the load time. So uh, these uh, results, those gains, come from the, the simple fact that uh, building the B tree is significantly slower than building the Brin index. Uh, now, the, the great win there is that uh, in order to build the index, we need to scan the data, uh, and the Brin index can be built completely in memory as we build uh, the index. With the B tree, we need to scan it, we need to sort it, and then insert the insorted uh, uh, rows into the index. So it's a significantly longer process. Uh, that gets a lot worse if the index itself uh, falls out of memory, because if you're building a very big index, uh, then we end up needing to do a, a different sort algorithm, which slows it down even further. Okay? So these are the effects of, of data that's completely in memory. Okay? <clears throat> what we then did um, was uh, to produce uh, a table growth test and uh, what we were doing here is to, um, uh, to uh, simulate what would happen in a very large database that is growing uh, by a fairly constant amount each day. Uh, and, oh, hello, Mark. Um, so uh, what, we were, uh, what we were doing there was, was simulating the idea that perhaps 1% uh, of the table would be added to each day. So it's a, a high volume incremental change uh, situation. And I think that uh, if I just uh, call out uh, the details there so that you can be sure to see them, the blue line at the bottom is loading the data if we had no indexes at all. The red line just above it is the, uh, the time taken to load that data with a Brin index added. And the line at the very top of the graph is uh, the amount of time taken to load data when we've got a single B tree added uh, to the data. Now the important aspect here that I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that the red line is almost uh, flat, whereas the B tree line goes up very slowly. Now, it's, it goes up so slowly that on a day-to-day -day basis you probably haven't noticed that your database is slowing down. Okay? But as your database is getting bigger, those B trees start to fall out of memory. Every insert into the B tree slows down as the B tree gets deeper. And what eventually happens is that graph keeps on going up and up and up and up to the point where when you get to terabyte-sized databases, building B trees on those things, uh, I did already use the word suck, um, so I'll just repeat that. It really does suck to have very large indexes. Uh, and so what we've got with, with uh, the Brin index is one of the objectives of it was to have a, what we call a constant time uh, addition uh, for the Brin index. So as we go up into the terabyte range uh, of uh, data, the Brin index uh, is able to maintain the insertion time uh, as we expand. And that's particularly important for very large databases. Um, the objective here is to build a data type that doesn't just work reasonably well on a 10 gigabyte system, uh, but uh, have something that's going to work well at 10 terabytes, or dare we even think about what it will be like with a 10 petabyte system. And I can tell you, if you did have a 10 petabyte system, I don't really want to sit and wait while a B tree gets added uh, that's going to be like five petabytes of B tree. So I don't even want to be there. In fact, 
it probably wouldn't ever finish. Uh, not, at least not until we get parallel index build. So, so we've got, um, by the way, where is Mark? Are you still hiding at the back? He went out again. Damn. <clears throat> I was going to ask him if he wanted to take over. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the overall load test at, uh, on a 30 gigabyte system uh, showed that the uh, using BRIN indexes uh, appropriately uh, reduces the actual load time for data by 26%. Now, this took a little bit of database design knowledge because the basic original test had 28 B trees on the database. And what we did was selectively replace uh, eight uh, indexes with BRIN indexes. Okay? So we tried to initially, we just replaced all the B tree indexes with BRIN indexes. And that's a bad plan. Okay? Because as I explained before, BRIN indexes only work when, uh, when the data is uh, appropriately organized. Okay? So uh, it is not true that you can replace every B tree with a BRIN index. Okay? So what we did was we select the best cases where we could use a BRIN index, um, and that, uh, that, was, that was good and useful, and it reduced the overall load time by 26%. Uh, so 15 of the 22 queries were able to use uh, the BRIN index type effectively. Uh, so that's uh, basically three quarters of, of tests. Um, now, this is an interesting uh, slide because uh, the pink bars there are the performance we get from BRIN indexes. And uh, if you think that you're not seeing it correctly, the BRIN indexes are slower than the B-tree indexes in uh, quite a few cases. Okay? Um, and I'm saying that that's actually a design objective of the system, that what we wanted to do was get build time and constant insertion time were higher on the list of performance objectives than uh, data retrieval time uh, for some of the queries. Okay? What we will also see in, in other areas is that uh, there are cases uh, where the performance of the BRIN index is very cool and much better than a B tree, but in general, what we were doing was to, to have a, a retrieval time that was roughly in the same ballpark as B trees, uh, while at the same time uh, making them much more practical to use. So what I'd like you to do is think about what that's going to look like on a 10 terabyte system where uh, if you've got uh, a, a B tree where the, the B tree is so big that it's practically unusable in that situation, uh, even though the access time, if you had one, would be better, you realize that if you've ever tried to do create index concurrently, on a multi-terabyte system, it is, uh, I think the words, very severe impact on your system is uh, not quite sufficient. Whereas a BRIN index will actually build quite quickly on some of those systems. Um, so we do have some happy results. You can see query 20, query 2, both show uh, massive reductions in uh, query times uh, as against a B tree, uh, whereas in a lot of the other cases you can see there is some degradation, um, but it's, well, it's not too bad. <clears throat> so uh, the results that we had were that uh, using uh, the BRIN indexes gives an overall improvement uh, and this is averaged across all of the different query types uh, of 28%. Uh, so the, there's a, a, a clear net benefit from replacing some of your queries with this new query type. And I say some of your indexes. Um, 
another index comparison. Um, here we're uh, comparing having red is no indexes at all, green is B tree and blue is Brin index. Uh, so you can see that uh, there are cases where B trees just simply don't help, uh, but the Brin indexes work quite nicely. Uh, on the, uh, so on the power test, uh, having Brin indexes against no indexes is obviously fairly good. I don't, I'm not sure that anybody was suggesting having no indexes was, was a, a viable option, uh, but we measured it anyway. Um, but the, uh, the overall results uh, were that practical tests were showing that uh, uh, a Brin index is uh, 612 times smaller than a B tree. Um, obviously, that's just one measurement. Uh, don't expect it to be exactly the same. Uh, there are some configurable parameters that you can set on a Brin index, uh, and also it will depend upon how your data is organized. Uh, but in general, uh, you should see massive reductions in size uh, when using a Brin index. Uh, now, uh, the, the reason why that is important is uh, what we're saying is if you've got data that's, say, five terabytes in size, then a Brin index on that data might only be something like 10 gigabytes. Whereas uh, on a five terabyte system, if you build a B tree, it's easily going to be bigger than a, a terabyte and be quite slow. Uh, so th what then happens is on the larger systems, you get a huge amount of cache back for querying, for sorting, uh, for joining. Uh, and it actually makes uh, a significant difference on, on what we call the memory pressure in the systems. So instead of having B-Tree uh, occupying almost your whole cache, uh, now you're going to change that to actually having that uh, RAM available for, for query workloads. Um, so there's some scalability results uh, that we've got as well. Uh, how much longer have I got? Uh, 15, minutes. 15 minutes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, on the scalability tests, we can see that the, uh, uh, the additional patches that we tested uh, produced uh, a 20% improvement um, and uh, a 14% improvement uh, just with the most recent tests. So what we're talking about is comparing 9.2 against uh, the latest branch of 9.5 development. Um, the, the scalability of the tests was uh, considerably better. This is on a throughput test. We can see uh, the number of streams was, uh, was better and the overall uh, throughput was better as well. Um, so the, the tests that we've, we've got showed that taken as a whole, um, the overall uh, results were that we can significantly improve the number of queries per hour uh, that these systems can handle uh, in comparison with the same situation uh, roughly uh, two years ago in terms of the, the software. Uh, and on a four socket system, it becomes uh, very clear that we've made significant gains in terms of throughput. Uh, so what I've wanted to do just... So the, uh, the other results that I've got in terms of uh, the, the tests were actually broken down uh, by queries uh, so that you can see uh, that we've made gains on every single query uh, in the benchmark uh, and a lot of the queries have uh, improved radically in terms of their uh, performance. Um, what I would say is that uh, we are yet to, uh, to make even larger gains uh, in terms of uh, query throughput. Um, there are a number of queries that we cannot improve without either materialized views 
or parallel query. Uh, we've kind of done pretty much everything we can think of to do. Uh, there's a number of them uh, where we're also hoping to improve performance using column store techniques. Uh, one of the tests that we did on this uh, workload was uh, we uh, mimicked the performance of, uh, 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 of a column store by literally dropping all of the columns that were not needed for particular queries, and uh, which, which obviously is cheating, uh, but uh, what we were trying to do was prototype what the performance would be like if we had a column store and the query uh, and the columns that were not part of that query were basically just not touched at all. Uh, and when we did that, uh, we got uh, an improvement in performance, just do nothing else, uh, of 25% uh, improvement by, by using column store. Uh, so one of the things that we're hoping to do in the next release is work on uh, column stores. Um, and uh, really this is for Robert's benefit uh, uh, that there are certain queries uh, that we understand need uh, parallel query in order to get improvements on. But the, uh, this is quite a good query mix because we're able to identify particular queries that, make, uh, that, that can be speeded up in, by particular techniques. Oops. <clears throat> um, so I'm uh, switching around a bit with some, uh, the, some of the performance results that I've got. Um, we also did some testing. Uh, these results come from uh, Thomas Vondra. Um, and uh, what uh, Thomas did was use uh, a similar benchmark called uh, TPC-DS. Uh, it's a business intelligence queer, uh, uh, benchmark in the same way that uh, TPCH uh, was. And um, interestingly, you can see that we've made significant gains in performance uh, from the days of 8.0 down to uh, the latest version 9.4. So the performance differences that I was talking about just now uh, were differences between here and the latest 9.5 development version. Um, and uh, the performance that we've achieved on a uh, four core box uh, difference between 9.2 and 9.5 development version, we got uh, a 232% increase in throughput just between this point here and this point here. So you can see overall we've done uh, quite a lot of work to improve things down the years. One of the most interesting things uh, that I note from uh, this graph uh, is you can see in the middle of the graph there's kind of regressions. Yeah, uh, We're actually doing relatively badly um, uh, in, in terms of performance and uh, that's basically the period where we stopped measuring performance. Uh, so the early days are, are uh, when Mark, uh, who used to work for uh, OSDL, uh, was active uh, in uh, regular testing of Postgres to check that we were actually improving performance. And that worked, you can see, by regularly publishing to everybody what the results were of performance tests, we were able to bring things down. Uh, then I think Mark uh, moved on uh, to some other jobs and basically nobody took over for a, a few years doing those performance tests. And what's then happened is round about the sort of 9192 time frame, uh, people like Robert, people uh, in other areas have started to do more performance work and we've begun to to bring the performance back down again, okay? So it, it, while you might look at that and go, oh, you had a problem at 9.0, the problem was actually a systemic one in the sense that we weren't measuring performance, and so, you know, it crept up slightly, yeah? 
Uh, so that's a, a lesson for us all. Um, uh, I love this graph because it's so difficult to interpret. Uh, so <coughs> I feel like, I feel like it kind of lends me credibility to have a really complex graph. So <coughs> um, this is uh, a, a very strange way of saying that um, the uh, uh, the gin indexes, gin fast scan. Uh, produced an algorithmic speed up uh, in uh, performance. Uh, so what actually happened was, uh, uh, no matter how fast the query was, it was replaced by a very fast uh, uh, query when when we get at 9.4. So basically, uh, the faster the query or the slower the query was, the more it was speeded up. Okay, um, but uh, the, the the reality there is. Uh, at 9.4, uh, GIN fast scan basically completely flattened the curve. So uh, queries that were executing in quite a range of different times all came down to very fast performance. Okay, so it's a complex graph to say we made it faster. <laughs> so cool. Um, and is Mark going to come back in? No. Could somebody just? Pop their head round the door and grab Mark if he's there. Okay. Yeah. So um, the uh, the highlight uh, really of uh, the performance results uh, was that taken together using uh, the uh, concurrent hash table using the uh, atomic locking improvements um, and uh, the, uh, the, the better cache line uh, padding, um, plus all of the other improvements that had already gone in uh, to Postgres. And then in addition to that, selective replacement of certain indexes uh, with Brin indexes gave us overall uh, the difference between 9.2 and 9.5 development was a 232% gain in overall system throughput. So this is a busy data warehouse executing a large number of queries. Now, that result is particularly interesting to me because what I see out there is that there are a lot of people using Postgres for business intelligence. Uh, when you speak to all these guys doing big data, um, if you have a big data system, those the, it frequently ends up that queries go faster, but they're not able to uh, produce as many answers per hour um, just simply because some of those systems, they're using all the power of the system all at once, and they're, they're poorer at throughput uh, than you would expect. So one of the key places where Postgres is, uh, ha has got uh, utility there is the, uh, the throughput case, where there's a very busy system doing lots of complex queries. And that's actually uh, the area where we've uh, improved the most. So I think that's, that's a, an important result. Um, but uh, just to link back through what you've heard, basically what we've said is that uh, the new Brin indexes are very exciting. Uh, they've got very clear advantages when used appropriately. Uh, uh, plus, we've got a number of other uh, internals uh, tweaks uh, that are coming in the later releases, and they are proven to be very effective for business intelligence. I can't speak to whether they are uh, improvements for OLTP only because we haven't measured that. I believe they are, uh, and I've got a feeling that, the, the, if I recall from Andres's results, that the benefits were actually better in OLTP. Uh, but I don't have hard numbers on that uh, from the uh, the systems. So uh, what I'd like to do at this point, seeing as Mark's just walked back in, is. Uh, don't give me a clap, give Mark a clap, because he did all of this work. Okay, so. Uh, so, given that you've arrived, Mark, you can probably help me with some of the questions on these things. Um, 
there were some points I, I couldn't talk, I, I got one thing wrong earlier actually. Um, were any particular questions? Um, yeah, basically, because uh, there will be uh, a call to uh, the, um, the index management functions, but that won't necessarily result in uh, an action on the index. Uh, so the, the Brin index is indexing the minimum value and the maximum value for a whole range, and unless those, changes, uh, unless those change, the, the, the index itself won't change. Now, what I would say is that the Brin indexes are not ideal for heavily updated data. Uh, they're definitely uh, more designed for uh, more, more sort of the, the append-only case. It, it's not true that they only work if it's 100% pure append. Uh, it's more a case of uh, there's a sort of uh, gradual decline in performance the more heavily the table is updated. Um, yeah, I mean, well, uh, just to repeat what I said, heavily updated data will uh, be a bad thing for the Brin Index. So. Uh, no, the data is not clustered because of the existence of the Brin Index. The Brin index takes advantage of the natural ordering of the data. Okay, if there isn't a natural ordering of the data, then there would be no advantage in the Brin index. Like, like, this is the example of the like if my data on the disk is not sorted by date, then um, how does it take advantage of the Brin index? Even if I move that it's not uh, I have these changes, if I can't reach to that particular uh, row on the disk. Right. The um, so. I mean, it's possible for you to cluster, you can issue the cluster command to, to physically sort your data, and then it will have a, a benefit. But the real benefit comes from uh, types of data where the arrival of the data naturally causes a segregation. So, uh, obviously, if we've got, uh, say, events or transactions or something like that, there's a natural ordering of the data so that the, the data at this end of the table will have an earlier log date and the data at this end of the table will have a, a later log date. And so as we insert into the table, there's a rough ordering to the table. It doesn't need to be exact. Yeah? Uh, we're, not, we're not relying on an exact sort property. What we're talking about is a, a natural tendency for... So if, if I ask for the last week's data, we know roughly that's up this end of the table and I can avoid all of the I.O. associated with the full table scan. Yeah? So it, it sounds like a kind of hit and miss operation, but what we're aiming to do here is produce a special type of index that is optimised for very large tables in a business intelligence context. Okay? Uh, well, when, yeah, we're not, I mean, the row ID obviously already is uh, sorted, but we, we're interested in indexing data that the user would know about. I mean, nobody does a lookup on row ID because it's not meaningful outside of the database. But. Yeah? Uh, I think it's more a case of particular columns benefit from one type or the other. Um, but the real benefit uh, for the very large tables comes where you actually replace 
one or two indexes with maybe, say, five BRIN indexes because you can, it's actually more practical to index columns that before when you sort of thought, oh, I'd love to put an index on that, but I don't have 200 gigabytes spare for the B tree that it would, uh, would uh, be created. Whereas the, because the BRIN index is actually smaller and faster to build, you can have a BRIN index on it. It's just more practical to put there. So, yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can, um, it, it does an index uh, heap scan in the same way so that you can actually use multiple types of index or multiple BRIN indexes to, uh, to retrieve the data. But obviously, only if the optimizer sees that that will work, uh, it's, it still goes through the optimizer in that same way, so, which gives you all the selectivity problems and that kind of thing, so, but yeah. An impact on the cluster operation. Uh, well, I mean, to all intents and purposes, cluster is impossible to use in production because it, it's so dramatic a command. Nobody's got enough time to sit and wait for that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, <coughs> Any other questions? Do you have a question for Mark? Those were all kind of about the design of the BRIN index. So, um, thank you, by the way. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I believe I'm uh, between you and lunch, so uh, never a good place to be. Thank you very much. Thank you.